and panelists, which if you just want to talk to me, that's totally fine. But you might want to pick panelists and attendees if you want everyone else to see. Yeah, it's one of those weird things about Zoom that I can't seem to figure out is that it, um, panelists, which you... oh, sorry, is that it, uh, it, it goes to just panelists instead of all panelists and attendees. So we'll remind you throughout. And don't be offended if we say, hey, Drew, can you resend that? That's a great comment. Can you send it to all panelists and attendees? Thanks, Jude. You know, Jude's only here because I just realized like 10 minutes ago, I was supposed to call her on Tuesday and I didn't. So I'm pretty sure she's just here. Should I put that in the agenda? <laughs> <laughs> and so everybody, we'll repeat this a few times, but um, this is our, our Zoom webinar. So you don't automatically have the privilege to talk um, with your microphone. But there are a few areas where, you know, we might, we're going to ask for feedback and you could give us that feedback in the chat box. Or if it's just easier just to pop on your microphone, you know, we're all Zoom superstars by this point. Um, uh, just raise your hand or you can even put in the chat box and I'll give you um, talking permission. It's weird to say, uh, but I'll, yeah, I'll give you audio privileges and you can you could uh, chime in that way. So the default is not to have a microphone, but if you'd like to speak and we would love for you to share, um, we can give you those privileges. And Annie and Stephanie, this is a reminder to close out your outlook and your teams and all the other things that are being, gonna be giving you notifications. Already done. I had not. <laughs> What else gives me notifications? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say you are the one that deems. Mine's the worst. Yeah. <laughs> Brooks is nodding emphatically. Ding, ding, ding. We're just wondering. This is not an official icebreaker question, but does anybody have fun Halloween plans or fun like Halloween pivots for trick or treaters? <laughs> Nah. I'm just thinking about what we're going to do in our neighborhood. Maybe sit at a table or something. I'm a Grinch. I'm not doing anything. My light's going to be off. Grinch. Well, put it's out like a doing a decoration early and just keep using it. <laughs> it's like doing take and make kits, basically, but small take and make kits. So I figure library staff would have um, a lot of good feedback. It is just like that. That's what I should. I should have stolen a bunch of the take and make kits for Halloween. <laughs> Yeah, we're just putting a bowl of candy out for folks. Um, my kids are not going trick or treating. So I got like the Costco size candy and my kids are gonna go room to room and eat as much as they want at night because that's our Halloween tradition and then hate themselves in the morning. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's cute. Sugar hangover. Well, y'all, I want oh, go ahead, Stephanie. I was gonna say, I just, I live with somebody, I live with a couple of people who are very immunocompromised. So I'm not even risking it. And I live in a community that doesn't follow all CDC guidelines, so I don't trust you. <laughs> Stephanie's so, saying she lives in the boonies. Um, Jude says, I don't know if this is real. I hope it's real. Jude says that she's delivering treats on a clothesline pulley system. I mean, if you have one, that's brilliant. Lisa, yeah, Lisa's saying package and zip snack bag set on the table. Jackie's right. kind of like Stephanie, kind of a Grinch. Yeah. All right, y'all, I want to go ahead and get started shoot. with our webinar oh. today, just because we are... We have a lot to fit in today and we don't have a ton of time. So um, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We're talking about a really important thing today and that's how um, you can build you know, partnerships and collaborations within your community, specifically by using a community dialogue. If you don't know what a community dialogue is, hey, don't worry, you're gonna find out all about it. Um, and just a few kind of guidelines and expectations for the day. Uh, for starters, we are live streaming this to YouTube. So just a heads up. They can't see your chat box messages though. So if I'm reading out your chat box messages explicitly, it's to coordinate with the folks on YouTube. Um, I've said it once, but I'll say it again. Please make sure when you chat, your messages are going to all panelists and attendees. It's just by default, it just goes to all panelists, which is kind of annoying. And we want everybody to see your comments. Um, Brenda, for example, just said, my kids and I are doing a trunk or treat drive by and we put candies in bags so kids don't have to get out. Brenda, would you please share that with all panelists and attendees? Thank you. Right on. Um, so yeah, just a heads up on that. 
Some call-in numbers can be found down below if you do need to dial in. Um, and uh, lastly, you don't automatically have microphone privileges today, but there are a few areas where we might want you to jump in and, and say something, whether it's in the chat or with your voice. So all you have to do is raise your hand. You can even say it in the chat box. You can send me a direct message and we'll promote you to give you those um, uh, audio privileges. All right, next slide. Just a quick, you probably know us all um, or you see, you see our faces up here. Uh, I'm Brooks, we have Annie, we have Stephanie, and you'll be hearing more from each of us on different sections today. So the next slide, just a quick overview of our agenda. After I get done talking, I'm gonna let Stephanie do a fun icebreaker to kind of loosen this all up. Um, Annie's gonna be giving you the Community Dialogue 101 and we're going to have a group discussion uh, in our, or kind of a, a group interactive time. In the webinar description, there was a few prompts. Uh, if you didn't get to see them, that's okay. We can, you know, make time for you to think about them. But if you did have a chance to look at those prompts, um, we're going to be talking about those and annotating on the screen. Stephanie's going to cover how we can specifically pivot our community dialogues to a virtual setting. Um, and then Annie's going to be walking through some, some new resources about community dialogues with you all. And during that time, our question for you all is like kind of what resources do you have at your library already that can help you with community dialogues um, in the future? Um, so just, you know, you can think about that uh, and it would be great if anybody would, would feel free to unmute or, or raise their hand and we could let them talk during that part. We'll close with a Q&A and a chat and I just have like a slide with a few last parting words for you all um, at the end. Won't quite probably be five minutes, but uh, so that's just an overview of our agenda for today. The next slide. And so, yeah, today's webinar is generously funded um, by our friends at the National Science Foundation. And this is actually a specific project we're working on um, for NSF. So we'll go to the next slide. And this is called the STEAM Equity Project. <clears throat> now, a big part, I will say, of the STEAM Equity Project is uh, there's an exhibit component. And we are already kind of deep into the application process with that. And I believe the applications have already come in for that. Um, but what I'm talking about today with STEAM Equity is like, things that are available to just the libraries, the library world in general, right? So for, for the greater good of library staff and, and to help you all succeed with your programming, to help you all succeed with your partnerships and just to help you all succeed in the next few years. This is, um, STEAM Equity is not just about the, the libraries that are giving the exhibits, it's much more than that. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, I should say we have some great partners on this project too, including SciGirls, ALA. Um, but I want you all to think about STEAM Equity, like what we're trying to do is empower tweens and their families around equitable, keyword, STEAM learning and career paths, right? Um, so getting uh, uh, tweens and, and families, specifically, you know, we really want to reach girls. We really want to reach Latinx audiences, um, audiences that are underserved, um, and, and, and let them know that STEAM careers are a potential career path for them. So we want to learn how library workers can more effectively support that tween interest um, and that persistence as well. You know, you, you don't like STEAM once, try again and, and try to get into it, um, especially in rural communities. So there's a focus on rural communities here. Um, but here's where this webinar and you all come in. We're trying to just share what we discover about STEAM learning and community collaboration. So as we learn these things, as we work with library staff on this project, we're going to be sharing those lessons out um, with you and, and those resources out with you to help you, um, you know, whether you're part of the, the project, you put in an application, or whether you're just a library staff trying to do more STEAM facilitation, um, uh, we want to share what we're learning with you all. So we'll go to the next slide. And I just want to say a few things and point you in the direction of a few resources. Now is normally when I'd say, oh, go to our next webinar and check out the STEM Activity Clearinghouse and other StarNet resources. And I'm kind of still doing that, but in a different way. Um, so collaborations and partnerships are a huge part of the library world. And they have been for a while, but I really am foreseeing, you know, in the next, in the future, as we're coming out of this pandemic and out of this virtual world, as community collaborations and partnerships being such a big part of the library world. I'm sure you're all sitting there shaking your head right now, hopefully agreeing. Um, so I wanna point you in a few directions on our StarNet website. Um, uh, Annie's gonna be talking about community dialogues, which are a really great tool for community collaborations. Um, but if you go to our website, and Stephanie just dropped it in, in the chat, um, we have a whole list of community collaboration ideas, whether you're, you wanna work with NASA and do space stuff, whether you wanna work in the after school realm, engineering is a really great um, uh, place where you can collaborate. And a lot of these are on a national scale collaboration, right? Um, so thinking about big organizations that you could collaborate with um, uh, and less about, you know, the community di community dialogues are more of a, a local flavor, if you will. Um, so so that, that's a one website you could go to. And if we'll go to the next source or the next slide, sorry. Um, I would also encourage you to check out some webinar recordings that we've done in the past. And I highlighted a few on this slide. 
and these slides will be available after the webinar. Um, and the URL right there, Steph, if you wouldn't mind dropping that URL in, of some recordings that you could watch that I think would help prime you and get you ready um, to be more collaborative and to, and to find partners in your community uh, on a state level as well and on that national level. Um, so just somebody just raised their hand, but um, if you do want to talk, yeah, just put up your hand and we'll find you. But um, so a few of these, uh, the first one's about engineering and how you can collaborate with engineers. And the second one's about, yeah, NASA subject matter experts can be a great, um, a, a great resource. Um, this next one's actually about grappling with unconscious bias and, and understanding, you know, our own biases that we may have. And I felt like that would be really important to, to have a grasp on as you're moving in uh, to talking about collaborations, you know, making sure that you're not holding any of those biases as you're reaching out to collaborators. Uh, these last two are part of our, you know, STEAM equity webinar series. We have Closing the Gender Gap, which is talking about developing gender equitable STEAM programs. And um, the next one is Culturally Responsive STEAM programs. So again, those are important um, things to think about as you're thinking about collaborators. So I believe that was it for my introductory part. I'm going to turn things over to Stephanie. I'll um, be in the chat box. If you have any questions, please um, uh, feel free to, to ping me and I'll see you all at the end of the webinar. Hey everyone, thank you, Brooke. So we're gonna play a little bit with this icebreaker and we found this neat little thing that you can do with Zoom, which is called annotate. Um, so if everybody can go up, I believe it should be in the middle of your screen. There will be a title that says view options with a little arrow. If you click down, it'll say to annotate. You click that, that means you can do a whole bunch of things. You can text, you can draw, you can stamp, you can arrow. This, these are things we're gonna be doing later on in this webinar where you'll be able to kind of mark things you agree with, put some quotes in, add some of the things you want. Um, but until we get there, let's play a little bit. So what I'm gonna have you guys do is this is the Jack-O-Lantern Nebula. So if you guys wanna start drawing some really spooky things in the spirit of Halloween, um, some people are saying they are not seeing it. Brooks, help. It should be up if you highlight your mouse over your screen, they'll, you know, at the bottom it says mute, stop video, participants, things like that. Up where it says you are viewing a screen, it should be right up there. Yeah, mm -hmm. so some of you, um, especially if you're on a Mac, the bar stands, tends to stay big. Um, so there's mute, stop video, participants, Q&A, and then annotate. So it should be a little pencil. So you click that or like Stephanie said, there's the little dots and then a drop down. And we'll give you guys a minute to figure it out because we would like you to be able to use it as we keep going. So if you need any extra help, don't hesitate to ask in the chat. Some people are still saying they can't see it. They're, they don't have those options. Hmm. Hmm. Um, let me go check the back end settings and see if it's enabled. Uh, okay. And that way we can come back to this or, or we could um, use it so for the- I'm, I'm gonna go ahead while we're thinking about it. Um, I do see where I can say disable annotation for others. So I'm gonna go ahead and disable and then re-enable, <laughs> right? Turn it on, turn it off again, turn it off, turn it, it back on. See if that works. All right, let's see if that works for anybody. Stephanie, are you able to do it? Can you double check? I can annotate. So like, for example, I'm putting a heart. You guys, can you see the annotation? Step one, can we see it? <laughs> putting little hearts because I don't like Halloween. Yes, okay, so people can see it. So we know that if you can annotate, you will see it. So that's a positive. <laughs> We're halfway there. <laughs> All right, so we'll we'll go ahead for now. We'll let Brooks go and figure that out. If we get to another place where we need to annotate, um, we will try this one more time. And if it doesn't work, then we will go ahead and just use the chat feature. Not a problem at all. Um, Stephanie, was there anything you wanted to add about our spooky nebula before I move to the next slide? <laughs> no, I was just so looking forward to seeing what people were gonna be creating. We'll come back, we'll come I'm back. I'm such a not Halloween fan. <laughs> All right, Annie, so I guess we're gonna continue. Yes, yeah, sorry, now <laughs> I think Zoom's just having a bit of an issue. Now I can't switch to the next slide. Give me a second. <laughs> this is 
says 2020. Yay, there we go. All right, guys. So hi, my name's Annie. I recognize so many names in the chat, but I see that there's some new folks too. Um, I am the Community Engagement and Exhibits Manager here. Stephanie was going to let you know that she's our relationship uh, coordinator, but we got stuck in the Zoom, <laughs> the Zoom up pit of despair as it were. Um, so I'm gonna spend just a couple minutes talking to you guys about what is a community dialogue. Um, and then we'll have an interactive portion where we'll um, talk about some of those questions that I had provided in the webinar description um, and kind of walk through um, some ways that uh, resources we already have in our own libraries um, can be uh, helpful um, to do these dialogues, not just when things are all hunky dory and we can be in person like this lovely dialogue here in Florida, but also um, while the pandemic's happening and we're having to move um, these sorts of things virtual. So we'll talk a lot about that too. Um, so generally speaking then, a dialogue is a loosely facilitated conversation, um, providing an opportunity for library staff and community members to, dis to discuss common community-based challenges and aspirations. Um, certainly, this is the STEAM Equity Project. We're doing this webinar for, so you're going to hear us talk about STEM and STEAM a lot. Certainly, many of our dialogues have had that sort of focus, right? So how STEAM can be brought to the forefront um, in your community. We've also had dialogues that have talked about um, hyper-local solutions to climate change, about serving specific underserved audiences. Um, in the dialogue that there's a picture of here on the screen, there's actually a really great conversation about serving homeschool audiences audiences. So those two women there that you see in the foreground of the picture um, are both homeschool leaders and they brought their kids with them to the dialogue. Um, we've also seen dialogues about working with local industry. So how you can, um, I don't want to say take advantage, but that's the word that started to come out of my mouth, how you can work with the for-profit industries in your area um, to benefit your community and then find benefits to that organization as well. Um, we also had dialogue centered around um, community health. So identifying hyper-local health concerns um, and how libraries can kind of um, be a starting ground for providing the information that folks need um, to address those issues. Um, so those can be things like um, dealing with health concerns um, while homeless. It could be things as simple as having um, um, community health clinics set up at the library, um, but just figuring out what are those connections in the community that can come to your home at the library where the things are already happening. And then, of course, what else would we be talking about with dialogue right now other than pandemics? So we've had about 20 um, virtual community dialogues happen in the last couple of months um, focused around issues such as the digital divide, right? How you can do quality programming for folks who might not have access to the internet. Um, issues of getting kids um, meals um, in areas where the school districts aren't able to provide that support, helping people who don't have internet access at home still be able to apply for jobs and apply for their government assistance, um, their, um, their social security or their unemployment benefits, right? All these things that you guys know you've had to kind of step up and figure out on your own. Um, there've also been dialogues that have happened addressing those issues and how other community organizations um, can help bear some of the brunt of that effort that goes into doing the services you guys are already doing for your patrons. Um, I wanted to share real quick, and you'll see this big, ugly blank um, area on my, <laughs> my screen here. We were going to play the annotate game again, so if anyone wants to try, go for it, but I'm not sure if we've gotten it fixed. Um, if you remember nothing else from this conversation today, I really want you to remember these dialogue ground rules. It's not super important um, to remember exactly who you should invite or the timeline of how you should do it. You know your community best and you'll be able to come up with those things on your own. Um, but these six really simple rules um, to make these fun and meaningful and enjoyable um, for the folks participating are, I think, the most important part. Um, you will notice at the bottom here, um, these are borrowed from ALA's Libraries Transforming Communities um, initiative from the Harwood Institute. So I want to make sure that that gets credited. Um, so ground rule number one, have a kitchen table conversation. 
Um, I'll go back to this picture. You might see in the background here, our friend Lisa is standing up at a podium. She was not at a podium for most of the dialogue. That just happens to be when I grabbed a picture. So circular tables or a bunch of square tables put together where everyone can be at the same place, right? Think uh, King Arthur in the round table where no one's at the head of the table. Um, everyone gets a chance to participate. No one is leading the conversation, though you might have a facilitator to make sure things uh, stay on track. Um, also really important to note, there are no right answers. People should be drawing on their own experiences. Anecdotes are fine as long as you're not just relying on them. Um, nobody at the table needs to be an expert, but if there is an expert, consider what they have to say. This is really about putting all the options on the table um, and hearing who it is um, that might want to have a voice um, as you move forward with the conversations. Number three, also very important, is to keep an open mind. It's really hard, right, when someone's talking and you're not agreeing with what they're saying, rather than, and I know you've all heard this, um, but it's so important, rather than listening for your opportunity to respond, actually try to take a step back and listen to what they're saying and really internalize it. You don't have to agree. You're never going to agree with everyone. But if you're listening to respond instead of listening to understand, the dialogue isn't going to get anywhere and it's not going to be a great experience for anyone. Um, it's worth noting, these aren't just rules for you guys as the librarians. We really encourage you to actually print these out if you're doing a physical dialogue um, in person, put them on the wall, put them at everyone's spot. If you're doing a virtual one, send them ahead of time. Um, it's also a good thing if you're um, kind of having a, a split screen, right? If you're doing a dialogue, so half of the screen with the question and the other half of the screen with these ground rules just always up. Um, the last virtual dialogue I attended, and um, I apologize, I wanted my um, librarian friend to talk to you about it, but I don't see her on the participant list yet. She had another meeting to attend. Um, she actually, she used her annotate feature, and when people were ignoring one of the rules, instead of interrupting and kind of throwing off the groove, because it's hard when you're virtual, she would just use that annotate feature and go put a star next to the question that she thought people, or excuse me, next to the ground rule that she thought people needed to pay more attention to. So there's a lot of ways to bring the conversation back without like interrupting and throwing off the flow in a virtual discussion. Um, your job as facilitators then is to help keep the discussion on track, um, stick to the questions, try to avoid rambling. You're always gonna go off in different directions and sometimes those directions are the ones you needed to go in. So it's not, your job isn't to be the strict hall monitor. We have six minutes for each question. It's more to make sure that people aren't belaboring a point, um, going down a path that you're not gonna be able to solve in the conversation. Um, while we, we all might enjoy, enjoy is not the right word, but we certainly all do it. We might all love ranting about federal politics. Ranting about federal politics isn't something you can change at the library level. So bring the conversation back to something you can control. Uh, number five, it's okay to disagree, but don't be disagreeable. This one's really hard. It's it's a good thing. Um, you might not believe me, but I promise it's a good thing if people are arguing. It's a good thing if people are fighting. Um, it means that they really care about the issue um, and they really want to do better. Um, that said, you can really care about the issue and really strongly disagree with someone without being rude. Um, so one of the big jobs of a facilitator, um, as far as this rule, rule number five goes, is just making sure that if people are agreeing, um, that everyone's framing it in the, these are the different opinions and not an us versus them or a personal attack sort of situation. Um, and then the very last rule, and I'm going to say the most important, and every dialogue I've been at, um, we've made that Rule number one and made it giant is we want people to have fun. Um, this isn't a dour, sad, really serious everyone in suits, right? Situation um, where you don't get to be creative or you don't get to share neat ideas or do anything exciting. Um, no matter how serious um, the topic you're discussing is, there are ways to make it enjoyable for folks so they want to keep having the conversation. Um, and so they feel comfortable inviting others to participate um, in future conversations. Um, so it looks like, because I don't see anything um, showing up on the screen, it looks like the annotate feature is still not working. So what I am going to ask instead um, is for people in the chat box, so we're going to do it. Um, Oh, and Annie, Brooke, we can try I'm sorry, something. Brooke said something. Go for it. Yeah. yeah if you want to <laughs> stop screen sharing on your end yeah. and let me screen share, maybe because I'm yeah. the host, it'll let me. Oh, um, interesting. Okay. Let me just try real quick. Sorry, y'all. We are demonstrating how a virtual dialogue might not go according to plan. <laughs> this 
specifying these ground rules. All right. You want to give it a shot? All right. Is anyone? I still have the annotate button, but that doesn't mean much. I'm a co-host. Is anyone else able to get it to work? So annotate could be either a couple of dots. It could be up if it says view options. Um, Claire says it's not available and I know she would know where to look. Okay. So that's okay, guys. So what I am going to ask instead, thank you for trying, Brooks. It's really not a big deal. Um, so what I'm going to ask instead is I'm going to ask this question both um, in a in-person situation and then in a virtual situation. So first for an in-person situation and you can go ahead and put your answers in the chat box, what might you do to make your dialogue more fun for attendees? Um, or if you wanna go the extra mile to make it more fun and more accessible at the same time. So go ahead and put your answers in the chat. And because I, I can't stand silence, I know Kelly is so good at like counting to eight uh, before she keeps talking. I just, it's not a skill set I possess. So yes, Christine nailed it. Yes. Food, right? I wish we were all live and together and I would hand you food. But yes, food is so important. Um, Adad says, wear a costume. Brenda says she tries to make things a game, having fun facts and goofy pics, serve a full, full meal. I'm coming to your dialogue, Julie. That sounds great. Um, Lisa says polls. Yeah, absolutely. Um, use a kitchen table background, Elizabeth. I love that. I hadn't thought of that before. Like, I'm just imagining, I don't know who's been to Disney World. I know Stephanie used to work there, um, but there's a restaurant called the 50s Dine-In and the, the everyone's dressed like an old 50s waitress and you're like kind of sitting at an old 50s table, like I think that would be a really fun kind of themed dialogue, right? And Country kitchen. Yeah, like grandma's. Oh, that's great, guys. Yeah, so you already said all the things I brought props for. You know, I got food, I got my beverages, all of that. That's great. What about, so that's ways to make it fun. How can you make it more inclusive? And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. So remember the, and I'll go back to the picture for you. Um, we saw, oh my gosh, never mind. Zoom just doesn't like me today. We saw the picture. Oh, I'm not controlling it, Brooks's. That's why. Um, I'm and a little you want to grab back control? Uh, yeah, I'll grab it back okay. so that you don't have to keep doing it. Um, <laughs> and I'll try to keep babbling while I'm doing that. Um, so we saw the picture, right, of Lisa Jackson's dialogue where um, the homeschool parents came and they brought their kids with them. What are some other things that you can do explicitly to let folks know that this is a accessible event for them? Julie said it, provide childcare. Provide childcare, oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, provide childcare. If you're not comfortable or able to provide childcare, do what Lisa did and dump the Legos and all the fun building and robot toys you have in a corner and let the kids play. We're all, gosh, especially now, I'm shocked my kids haven't interrupted the webinar yet. We're all so used to having kids interrupting us right now. It's totally fine. Um, so yeah, I see, um, oh, that's Brooks. Okay, I was gonna say, I see someone saying. <laughs> so let's, so let's, Brooks started us off. Oh, Katie, that's perfect. Have translators, absolutely. Um, what's, an, what's another option? What if, so um, I'll give you a good example from um, Colorado. So we have a large uh, Mexican immigrant population, recent Mexican immigrants, and in Mexico, um, libraries actually are not free and open to the public. They are these big, you know, bastions of the university world for researchers and the everyday Joe can't go there. So when we were doing dialogues um, down in Southern Colorado, we actually had a really hard time getting people to think they were allowed to come join us at the dialogue. So what might you do in that situation um, if you have a group who doesn't feel like the libraries for them? I see have an ASL interpreter, that's fantastic. Yeah, Julie, absolutely. Hold it in a place that people are comfortable in. Have it at a church, have it at a rec center. If it's nice weather, have it right now, right? Social distanced in a park. It doesn't have to be at your library to be talking about library ideals. Um, so what now, um, just because I'm looking, I'm going over on my time. Sorry, everybody. Shocking, Annie went over. Um, <laughs> what if you were virtual? What are some ways to make a virtual dialogue fun? Um, I saw providing fun and accessible. I saw closed captioning. I saw someone talking about um, doing Zoom polls. What else can you do virtual to make it fun?
I'm gonna give you guys a sneak peek of my Halloween costume. Here's one thing you can do to make it fun. Encourage people to have fun backgrounds and show up to the dialogue as a meme, right? I am the distracted girlfriend meme, very proud of myself. Um, I, oh, I like you, Christine. Christine says has a speaker who can't control the volume of their voice and is always very excited about everything. <laughs> Terry, absolutely. Mail gift cards for door prizes. Uh, the last virtual dialogue, um, I wasn't able to, do, to attend this one, but um, I got all the notes from it. Um, the librarian actually sent goodie bags to everyone. So, you know, all that candy and fun snacks and toys and stuff that we talked about. If you've got 10 folks, mail them a goodie bag so that they can have snacks with you. Um, I did see someone else said, um, Folks can cook their favorite meal and share the recipe for other people before you have the community dialogue. Um, yeah, Yvette, absolutely. Do some sort of hands-on family project or activity as well. You guys are great. You guys have nailed all of this. I'm gonna keep going though, just to respect um, everybody else's time. Um, I did just want to make sure everyone knew that these dialogues have been supported by NASA, um, the National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation, and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, and have happened in more than 165 libraries, including 20 virtual dialogues um, since COVID happened, and more to come. <laughs> Um, community dialogues have helped libraries expand their understanding of patrons' feelings or people who aren't patrons yet, uh, feelings about the library and its programs, obtain meaningful feedback on who visits the library and why, um, have conversations about how the library can better serve ethnically, economically, and geographically underrepresented audiences and how other community organizations can help do that. I can't stress that enough. We're not asking you guys to do this by yourself. Um, and especially during COVID where you're trying to do all of those things you used to do, help people sign up for WIC, help people um, collect their unemployment checks and look for new jobs. See who else in the in the country in the county can help you do that. And then on that same note, uh, better connect with local organizations and potential future partners that have shared interests and visions. And again, um, it's so hard to make new relationships right now. Stephanie will talk about that in a second. Um, but showing because we all know the library does, showing that you have the community's best interests at heart um, and that you want to help other people show that they do too um, is just a really powerful way to start these conversations. Um, <coughs> excuse me, Stephanie, I am choking and I need to get a drink of water. Would you mind starting facilitating this particular one? I know we can't annotate, so this will be in the chat again. Yeah, so kind of what we want to ask you guys is what audiences in your community are not making full use of library resources? This is a great question if you've never done a dialogue before and you're not sure where to start. Um, who in your community are you not able to reach? And you guys can just drop that into the chat and we'll read them aloud. Originally, we were going to annotate and it was going to be fun. Uh, yeah, so we nice have upvoted everybody. Just imagine in your head. And and I want you all to, to see my friend uh, Bookie over in the corner, who's now become Masky. Um, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna have him in all of my presentations moving forward. Um, so, so I see Latinx, teens, tweens, lots of teens. Imagine we're checking off the teens. Um, retirees. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Stephanie. <laughs> that retirees, low income adults. Yeah, people who think a library card costs money. I, it's so, sh every time I'm at a library, we're always, at libraries setting up exhibits or doing programs. I just hear so many people, oh, how much does a card cost? I, I just didn't know how many people. Millennials, that's right, we're the worst. We don't, we don't take good advantage of these things. <laughs> uh, working adults, absolutely. You guys all know this. There's this big gap, right, in library attendance. People stop coming when they hit around that tween age and they don't come back until they have little kids. Um, how to get those people in the middle, which yeah, right now are pretty much millennials, y'all nailed it. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead, um, that's great. So what I want you guys to keep um, those audiences in, in mind as we move to the rest of this presentation, because um, you're gonna wanna think about how you can use a dialogue um, to get uh, better access to those audiences and help those audiences feel like the library has something for them. Oops. So next one, how does my library provide equitable and relevant programming for diverse audience segments? So again, we put some examples up for you. Teen advisory groups are a great, great way to make sure you have teen friendly 
programs, um, doing collections that are specific to different audience segments? What else do you do right now or you know, that you want to do um, is providing equitable services? And I realize people are going to think a little bit harder about this one, and that's great. Ooh, drag queen. Ooh, yes, drag hour. queen story hour. Those are my favorites. Sensory story times. Those are huge. Bilingual programming. Video game tournaments. Oh, I would never have thought about that, but that makes perfect sense. Um, tween STEM, bilingual story time, family STEAM time. Family STEAM time is such a big deal. Congratulations, Brenda, on doing that. That's huge. Virtual reality, oh, Jackie's living in the future. Uh, building more robust foreign language collections. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Bilingual story time. These are all great. Um, so again, keep these in mind. If you felt like you didn't have a good answer here, Virtual robotics, we're gonna have to check in with a vet later. That sounds pretty fun. If you felt like you didn't have a great answer here, perfect. That's why you're at this webinar and we'll talk a little bit later about where you can find resources to change that. Um, one last one from Jude, um, uh, celebrating the traditions of different ethnicities. Absolutely. Um, and actually involving people from those ethnicities um, and doing those programs, right? Such, such a good practice. So let's move. Right, two more of these. So who in my community has the ear of the groups we wish to better serve? So think about those people from your first question. Was it the tweens? Was it immigrant populations? How can you get access to them? Or conversely, think about who already does a great job of serving them and how can you work together? Churches, absolutely, Jackie. Churches are huge. Um, the suggestions I gave were schools, social services agencies. William, yes, go to them. Don't just wait for them to come to you. Go to them. Absolutely. Wherever that may be. Um, education services districts, the schools, local Facebook groups. Yes, as um, one of our colleagues likes to say, mommy groups. Mommy groups are a great way to get access to different groups. Julie, absolutely. Legal aid services, the local chamber of commerce. I'll add the Hispanic chamber of commerce is huge. Um, different charitable organizations, employers. Oh, Jackie, I hadn't thought about that, but that makes perfect sense. Uh, Brooke says the NAACP. Yeah, absolutely. So don't think about, um, I think it was Will. Yeah, William said, don't think about how can I get them to come to me? How can I go to them either through these organizations or through having a partnership with, you know, say the social services agency to ask, where is it that these folks congregate? How can I make sure they know that the library is free and open to them? How can I let them know that we don't have fines anymore or that I don't require um, an ID to get a library card? All of these different things. Annie, can I say uh, one thing? I see yeah. Terry, Terry McDougall in the chat um, from West Virginia. Hello, Terry. Um, she and, and their group really opened my eyes. I see she's talking about the healthy grand families group for grandparents mm -hmm. raising grandchildren. I know um, where they are and in, in a lot of America, there's been you know a huge opiate uh, crisis mm -hmm. and um, a lot of grandparents that are raising grandkids. Um, so we were talking about a different program and Terry said, we actually like to promote a lot of our things and get the word out about our library services via public radio because a lot of those grandparents are listening in via public radio. And that always stood out to me as like, you know, we might not think about that immediately as we're in the, mm -hmm. you know, thinking about the future, um, but that's a great method for disseminating and getting the word out. So thank you, Terry. Yeah, thank you, Terry. And thank you, Brooks, for jumping in on that. That reminds me when we did our uh, Discover Health, Discovery La Salud program, we did a bunch of radio ad advertisements. And we heard when we did our focus groups with the, um, with the migrant workers down there that they would have never seen a flyer, they never would have seen a TV commercial, but they heard it on the local radio. So especially um, getting access to and I completely just forgot what the radio version is, but the <laughs> radio Telemundo um, and, and also Telemundo itself will do a lot of free pro advertising if it's directed at particular groups. That's a great idea, everybody. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go to the last one here. Um, so again, just kind of think of everything that we've already talked about and put it all together. So who are your partners right now? that you think would help you plan and implement a community dialogue. And um, keeping in mind, I know we're all thinking virtual right now. So who do you think will get on the phone with you and really hammer this out and invite the right people and make sure it's fun and exciting for everyone? <laughs> Again, my examples are schools and volunteers. 
Lo oh, local community college. That's a good one. Road scholars. Nice. Uh, library board members. Yes. Use your board members. They want to do these types of things. Um, city council members, friends of the library group, the county. So this is exactly how I expected everyone to answer. And these are all perfect answers. Um, you're talking about the people who already work with you, who do an amazing job and you know will come through. I want to encourage you to push yourselves a little further and go back to that list that we just talked about of people you think might have access to the populations you're missing and reach out to them. You're the library. You're not a for-profit organization that people are leery of trusting. Um, folks are excited to hear from you. And I know many of you know that, um, but those of you who are sitting back thinking, oh, I don't know that they'll want to, to play along. I don't know that they'll respond. You guys are the most trusted community organization. If they're not gonna respond to you, they're not gonna respond to anybody. Uh, William, yeah, absolutely. YWCA and YMCA are great options. Street fairs, yes. Uh, especially right now, I know a lot of people are doing uh, farmer's markets and stuff um, to avoid having to shop inside. That's a great idea. Church leaders. Yeah, these are all great answers. Um, so I just, I want to make sure I respect uh, Stephanie's time in the next section. So if you guys come up with any more answers, please um, continue to throw them in the chat. Um, but I am going to go ahead now and mute for a minute and get my voice back. And Stephanie's going to share with you some very pointed tips and tricks for hosting virtual uh, community dialogues. And again, um, encourage you all, if you have thoughts or suggestions as well, to keep throwing them in the chat. Go ahead, Stephanie. Okay. So yeah, so I'm going to cover, you know, what does a community dialogue look like virtually? Because when this was originally developed, the idea is that we could all be in person. Well, COVID-19 has decided to, you know, put a wrench in that, but you can still have these dialogues. You can still reach out to your community and you can do it in a safe way that follows CDC guidelines. Uh, so next slide, since I have no control. All right, so the where, the when, and the why. So similar to traditional community dialogue, you know, you want to plan a few weeks, few months in advance. Uh, backdating calendars are a great way to do that because um, you want to make sure you give your participants time to be engaged with you. You know, you want to make sure you can get as many people there as possible. So the longer you give them, the better chance you have that they will be able to come. Uh, and we recommend uh, platforms like we're using right now, Zoom, WebEx, Ring Central, anything that allows you to have control. A lot of people have been jumping to Facebook Live. That's great. The only problem is you can't control who comes in, who leaves, um, anything along those lines. So everyone has audio and visual that gives everyone an equal chance to talk and be seen and be heard. Um, some other pl platforms do not allow that. Uh, you have more control over the group. So, you know, yes, Zoom, Zoom bombing was a thing that happened at the beginning. Zoom has now rectified that, you know, they've made it a lot harder. You have the ability to kick somebody out if they're not being helpful towards what you are trying to do. And by having access to these, you can make your dialogue as big or as small as you want. You know, we talk about all these different populations that, you know, you're wanting to reach. Well, sometimes you don't want to have a group of 50 people. Maybe you only want to have a group of five and get a really meaningful conversation out of that. So by allowing you to have these different um, platforms, you can then control who and when you can reach them. Uh, next slide. And as I'm going through these, if you have an idea that you think would also benefit or you are like, hey, what about this? Please drop them in the chat because, you know, what COVID-19 has done to us is pivot. So if you have great pivot ideas, please let us know. Now, here's kind of the hard one. How do I reach out virtually? How can I reach these people who normally I could just walk up to and have a conversation? Can't do that. Emails and calls, cold call approach may be all you have. When you do a traditional dialogue, we usually don't recommend a cold call uh, approach. Well, we're in the time of COVID. So sometimes all you can do is email and call. Um, my recommendation, if you are doing these cold calls, use your network. Have somebody that you can CC on the email that you know this person knows. So say you have like a power patron who happens to know the city commissioner. Um, maybe you have their email also dropped in like the CC of saying, hey, this person recommended you to me. It's still a cold call, but at least you're building that relationship. You're building that, I know this person who also knows you, gives it a little bit more legitimacy. 
Um, ensure everyone is comfortable with the dynamics of virtual. You know, there's a lot of people, especially older adults, who aren't very comfortable using Zoom or Facebook or WebEx or anything like that. Um, if they are not comfortable, maybe find a way that you can walk them through it beforehand. Uh, if they have a grand, you know, grandson or granddaughter or someone else in the house that may be able to help them as well, reach out to them. Um, find ways that you can also help make them comfortable in this virtual realm. Um, if there's someone you really, really, really want, you know, I said, use your network, have a connection. Also see if you can find that person they can't say no to. I used to work for Boy Scouts of America, and this was a trick I was given, which I actually used and was very successful with. You know, if you want someone to really come, have their best friend ask them if you know who that person is. Have, you know, if you know the mayor, have the mayor ask them. They're not going to say no to the mayor, but help maybe find that person that they can't say no to. It means a little bit of digging and maybe a little bit of time on you, um, but it will pan out very much in the long run. And that's why we also say have a bit of time so that way you have the ability to do this. Next slide. And how do I facilitate a group mentality virtually? It's really, really hard to feel connected to people when you have a screen between you and them. Um, we've been going to a ton of virtual conferences and all I wanna do is network. And that's really hard to do because you do have this screen that is basically a wall. So what we recommend is maybe form a private Facebook group with um, all of your invitees. You know, let them talk to each other, communicate, kind of get to know each other beforehand if they have never met before. The other thing you can do, because not everybody's on Facebook, create a Google document that has everybody's like name and bio that people can go and go read about who's coming to this and maybe drop in, you know, conversations in there that can get started. Um, make sure that your invitees know this is this isn't like informational session, but a chance to learn from each other. So by having that as a precursor, they're not just going to go read about someone, they're going to go learn about them and maybe form a conversation and a relationship. And if you are reaching out to people, no is okay. You know, the virtual setting is really hard to do. And maybe you have a great person who loves to do a community dialogue, but they want to do it in person. That's fine. I have a feeling once you guys do one, you're going to be doing more because you're going to see the value in them. Save it for the time when you can actually do it in person if they really want that type of connection. And if internet is an issue, we do know we have a lot of libraries and rural communities and internet is very difficult to come around. See if you can find a space that you can be socially distant and allow for virtual interaction. So if you say you have a board member that would love to be a part of this, but they don't have internet, um, if you have like a huge community space, you know, they're on one side of the room, you're on the other side of the room, you both have computers so you can interact with everyone to keep it as virtual as possible, but you're also staying safe. Um, so it's kind of finding those ways of dealing with things like the digital divide. And that also allows it to be a lot more equitable um, because we do know a lot of communities don't have access. If um, I've heard of some libraries doing hotspots, potentially if you have a hotspot, you can you know, rent that out to them. Um, it's finding those ways of how do I make sure that these people can come. And I think that was my last. Oh, Ju said, on the other hand, the virtual setting can give people a secure feeling so that they can speak. Absolutely. You know, for me, I'm a little more extroverted. I like to be around people, but some people actually have kind of enjoyed the quarantine and having that screen and, and feeling like, okay, I can turn stuff off and take a breath for a second. So that's a great um, observation. Absolutely. And Stephanie, I wanted to say there is a virtual dialogue happening next week and they did exactly what you're talking about. So they have some hot spots that they've been, I think they got a grant. Um, so they have like 50 of them that they've been checking out to patrons and they just, you know, held a couple of them back and they're sending them out to the um, patrons that they want to participate in their dialogue. So the homeschool family and this, and right, all these different people that wouldn't be able to do it. So that's a, that's a great suggestion. All right, so now we will get to the portion where I'm going to show you all of the cool new resources that we've been developing as part of the STEAM equity program to support our dialogue effort. Um, you guys are also the first to hear that we are in the process of doing a brand new web page. Um, so because we're in the process that we're doing a brand new web page, it means we couldn't put all of these new dialogue resources up um, because we need to wait until the new pretty awesome, amazing back end. So everything 
that you need is in one single spot. It is in a blog on our webpage. So I am going to go ahead and share um, my Chrome. Do, 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 do. All right. So thumbs up or Stephanie Brooks, somebody tell me you can see this screen. And if I switch to different tabs, you're switching with me, correct? Thumbs up. Awesome. That only works about 3% of the time. So to get to this place where you can find all of these resources, go to uh, resources and then head down to Starnet blog. And then the blog post where we have put all of these resources is right now, right up on the top, new resources for dialogue in your library. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and open that. And then when you go into this blog post, there is a clickable PDF. So if you just um, hover over this, you can see that you can open it. I'm not going to open it now because I've opened it in another tab. Um, so you can open this PDF and we'll go over that in a second and kind of search around and find cool stuff. Or if the clickable PDF isn't working right for you um, or you just don't want to use it because you'd rather have a list, um, there's also a list below of all of the different things that we have developed in support of this webinar and the STEAM Equity Project. Um, so as we were um, getting these resources ready for STEAM Equity, we decided to focus on four main areas um, that we thought would help people um, with dialogues um, serving Latinx populations, because that's one of the main populations um, we're hoping to help folks serve in the equity program. Um, also taking into account the virtual um, situation we find ourselves in. So those four categories then are Latinx engagement, um, just diversity and equity writ large, because that's just always important to these conversations. Youth co-development um, or positive youth development. You've probably heard one or both of those terms. Um, and then this meeting people where they are is the kind of COVID, what are we doing? Where are we doing it um, sort of resources. Um, so let me pretend I've clicked on this now and I'm gonna go ahead um, and maybe open the right one. Oh my goodness, people, you would have thought that they'd have opened in the right order. <laughs> there it is, just kidding. Um, so this is now the clickable resource from our blog post. Um, so easy to follow steps. Um, I made it for people like me. You all should be able to figure it out. Um, so there's a couple different ways you can use this resource. Uh, excuse me, number one, I recommend you start here at step one um, to access our Dialogue 101 resources. So the Dialogue 101 resources are the background on what is a dialogue. Um, if people have done them before, which they have, can I steal their questions? Can I steal their media templates? Why, yes, you can. They're all in the Dialogue 101 resources. So let me just randomly click another tab. Oh my gosh, I got the right tab. That will never, ever happen again. Um, so this is Community Dialogue 101. It's got those ground rules. It's got um, some examples of what dialogues can do for you. Um, this is really good if you, I, 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 this is also now the time to note because this one's kind of ugly. Um, these are all draft resources. Our graphic designer will be making new ones once our webpage is up and ready. So you're feel free to use these if they're helpful to you to you, or just steal the language out of them. I always like if you've got kind of a reticent leadership team sharing the information from the Community Dialogues 101 sheet with them um, so that they know what the benefit of them is and that you're not the only one doing it and that this is actually um, a tested um, method to reach out better um, to your community. So I'm gonna close this tab now so that I don't try to open it again and go back here. So that's what I would recommend you do first. Go to the Community Dialogues 101. Um, when you're in that Community Dialogues 101, the very first thing you can go to is the Getting Started with Dialogue. So this has all of those links I was talking about to sample questions, dialogue tips and tricks, template invitations, literally everything you need to do or that you need to have to get your dialogue started with as little effort as possible from you. You don't wanna to have to go and design all of these things. Someone has already done them for you, so use them. Um, also really important down here, I wanna make sure you see is this timeline one. Stephanie talked about timelines. I think they're even more important um, now that we're in a virtual world. So definitely make sure you check that out. Um, so once you get to this sheet, you have two options. One is the full community dialogue guide. So I'm gonna go ahead and open that. So this is the guide that we made in support of our NASA at My Library program. Um, 
and the dialogues we did with that. This is about a 35 page document. Um, so you can choose to read this whole 35 page document. I think it's fantastic. I also wrote it though. So maybe you shouldn't trust me. Um, if you're the type of person though, seriously, that likes to sit down and read everything, I should show you the stack of books I have over here for how to do X, Y, Z. If you're the type of person who just wants to sit down and get all the information and absorb it, just read this guide. You don't need to go look at any of the other resources I made for you because they're all just pieces of this. So if you're that person, read the guide. If you are not that person, um, now we've got you covered. So you can pull out all the pieces that might be relevant for you. So this is again, just the general dialogue resources. And then you can go back to this document over here and browse other sorts of resources. So if you're like, Guys, I've already done dialogues. I do this in my sleep. I know how to do all of that. But wow, I really have a problem reaching out um, to the Latinx population in my community. Um, and, you know, I just want to add little asterisk there. Um, we're using Latinx in the STEAM Equity Project because that's what we have found with our advisors makes the most sense in their communities. Certainly other terms might be more appropriate for your community. And absolutely, if you actually know the ethnicity um, of the people you're working with, if they are from Mexico, they are Mexicans, right? You don't need to lump if you know where people are from, but this is kind of our default to be all encompassing and to be gender inclusive. So again, I just wanna make that clear. We're not advocating for any one term here. Use the one that makes the most sense in your community. So rewind, rewind back up. So you, you're the best at dialogue, you've done it, but help, I can't, I need help with the Latinx resources. Um, so you go and click that and this opens up and this is a clickable document with all kinds of great resources that we have found um, from ALA and from Reforma, um, from Web Junction, from all kinds of folks. So um, how to build on assets in your community, how to reach out authentically, um, ALA guidelines for services to Spanish speakers, how to build your collections, anything you might need to know that is relevant, not just to conducting dialogue, but also to general community engagement efforts for this group. This is a fantastic place to start, and I recommend that you do it that way. Um, now that's if you wanna dig deep into everything. So we have one of those for each of those categories I said. So that's our Latinx one. We have one for DEIA resources, which again has like seven different resources you can check out here. Um, one on co-creating with teens. Um, someone please laugh at my joke because Brooks didn't laugh at it. So I'd really like someone to um, make me feel better about myself. Um, so this is the one on co-creating with teens. Uh, meeting people where they are, which is again talking about building partnerships um, in a COVID sort of environment. Um, that brings us back to this one. So you can go and explore all of those. Um, that makes a total of 35 different individual resources. About three quarters of them are just one pagers, so really easy to get through, but some of them are actual full guides, a little bit longer. Um, so let's say you're me you want to read everything, but you don't have time and you can't commit to going through all those resources, you have yet another option. So making it clear, no one has to do all of the things I just said, you pick the one that makes the most sense for you. Um, so could I get, um, oh, I've only got five minutes left. So I'm just gonna show it to you real quick. That's why Brooks, Brooks turned on his camera to let me know. Um, so I just wanna show you really quick. We do have set up on SurveyMonkey. Uh, I've already taken that survey. Isn't that shocking that I took the survey that I made? Oh dear, uh, apparently I need to switch that feature. There we go, I haven't taken this one. Um, so you can go and answer questions um, and I would encourage you please answer them honestly. This isn't about making you feel bad about what you're already doing in your library. This is about saying, Annie gathered all these resources for you, Stephanie and Brooks, everyone gathered all these resources. Let's give you the one you actually need. Um, so I'm just going to go through all these questions real quick. Y'all can look at them later. Stephanie, um, if you wouldn't mind putting the links in the chat, that would be great. So let's just assume that this person has done nothing to reach out to folks during COVID because they don't know how. So that's how we're answering all of these, <laughs> all of these questions. Help, I don't know what to do, right? So once you go and answer all of those questions, you get your score. And I apologize, you have to actually copy paste here um, because... 
SurveyMonkey won't let me uh, do a hyperlink there. So you can copy that and go ahead and paste it into a new browser. And instead of having those 39 or whatever different resources um, for doing, uh, doing this sort of work, this engagement work in your library, we've highlighted the three that we think are most relevant for you based on where you're at. So if you've not done any reaching out to the community during COVID, we think that you should listen to a webinar on virtual dialogues. You should look at what having a partner means, what roles and responsibilities are, and then also look at this virtual programs 101 webinar um, that Brooks and Claire did uh, that talks about how to have an engaging virtual conversation. Um, so, and then if you would have answered, yes, I've done all of these things, then there would be kind of different resources for someone who knows the basics and wants to dig a little bit deeper. Um, so I really encourage you guys to go through those and I apologize, I was hoping we could do some of these live, but we ran over, I think, trying to figure out some of those annotation issues. Um, so I will, boop -ba -doo, Sorry, I couldn't find my screen share. I will stop screen sharing. And again, Stephanie has put those surveys down in the chat for you. Um, if you would like to have a conversation about how your library can use these resources um, or how to move forward using these, please reach out to me or Stephanie and we can certainly do that for you. The important thing here is to know you're not the only ones struggling during COVID to figure out how to make new partners, how to activate the partners you have and how to continue authentically serving your underserved audiences. So we're hoping that these resources, we know you're doing a great job, but that these resources make it a little easier for you so you don't have to do it all on your own. Um, so that was my, my feel good ending. I'm gonna pass it off to Brooks, um, who's going to remind you of a couple other things. But again, please do feel free to reach out. Um, as you can tell, we really like sharing this information with you and we're happy to keep talking. We're all muted, Brooks. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. I only had a few parting words for you. Um, we only have a couple of minutes left. So let me just see if it'll go right to the, you know, I'm just gonna leave it right here. Um, so uh, just housekeeping things. When you close out of this, you'll be directed to a survey monkey link. I'm uh, just asking you a few basic questions about this webinar. And uh, in that webinar, if you have it, or in that survey monkey link, if you have a chance to say, you know, here's what I would like to see in the future. Um, here's what I need as a library staff right now. Here's how, how y'all can support me at Starnet. Um, that would be really, really, really helpful. Um, secondly, I've put my email address down on this slide along with Annie's and Stephanie's. If you are stuck or if you want to have a short conversation or a long conversation about collaboration ideas, programming ideas, please do reach out. Um, we are here to support you all and um, offer you know free pre-programming resources and, and STEM strategies and all that stuff. So please do feel, reach out to, feel free to reach out to us. Um, so yeah, my feel good <laughs> final notes are just Remember that you're not in this alone. There are a lot of other organizations with like-minded goals um, and with their own expertise too. Um, so you, if you ever feel like, you know, you're the only person trying to help the patrons of your community learn about STEAM or STEM, you're, you're absolutely not, not alone. It's just making those connections and making those uh, partnerships. Um, think about partnerships on a local, state or national level. They can exist in several different ways. Um, and lastly, just kind of a note, like when you're facilitating STEAM, it's not about being the content expert and don't try to be the content expert um, it's about, you know, don't fake it till you make it. Turn to the experts, turn to those sources that have that information. You are about bringing people together and, um, and, and providing resources. Let the experts be experts. You focus on bringing people uh, together. So this webinar will be, it has been recorded. It will be uploaded very shortly um, to our Starnet uh, Libraries website and, and also to our YouTube live page. Thank you all so much for joining us. Again, any questions, any thoughts, any feedback, put it in the Survey Monkey. send us an email directly. All right, thank you all. Thanks everyone and thank you for participating when we couldn't get our